Let's give the Lord our attention this morning. Let's give that to him, huh? Amen. Let's give him our focus. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be home. It's good to be here. Missed, missed you guys. There's no, there's no place like this place. There's not. There's not. Well, let's give our hearts to him in worship this morning. Let's delight ourselves in him. Let's enjoy him. I want to read Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7 over us today. Oh, come and let us sing to the Lord. Oh, come and let us sing to the Lord. Your voice matters today. It's not let me sing to the Lord today. It's us. Let us sing. Let every person with the voice that God has given them sing to the Lord and give him glory today. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. How many of you know there's joy in the kingdom of God? There's joy. There's joy. When you worship, when you embrace the obedience to worship, joy will be much more than a feeling. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God. What's the reason? What's Because the Lord is great. Has any season of life or anything that we're going through changed who he is? He's great today. He's great and worthy to be praised. He's our great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also in his hands. He holds everything below and above. He's in control. He's sovereign. He's watching over mankind. He sees us today. The sea is his, for he made it, and also his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We come before you today, King Jesus, as a church that is in love with you a church that is not ashamed of you, a church that desperately needs more of you today, a church that loves to hear from you, loves to be taught by you, led by you, empowered by you, challenged by you, pruned by you. Jesus, you are a great shepherd. You are a healer. You are a king. You are a gracious teacher and leader and so merciful in all of your ways. The kindness and compassion of our God and Father has been displayed through you, Christ Jesus. So today we come to reciprocate that love. We come to display our love back to you. And as we worship, we will be changed. We will be transformed. We will be taken from glory to glory. I just pray the simplicity of your love today would captivate hearts. We come to you with thanksgiving for everything that you're doing and who you are. The report from on high is that you're still on the throne and you're so good. And so we rejoice in this place today. We give thanks in this place today. We love you and we surrender ourselves to you in this time. In your mighty, holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and stand and just begin to love on him and worship him. and glory and honor today. 
We're nothing without you in this place. We're nothing. We've got nothing apart from you. We bless you. We honor you. We speak the name of Jesus in this house, the name that rules above every other name. We give you our attention. We fix our eyes on you today. your presence with these songs we invite your love today thank you thank you for saving us thank you for delivering us thank you for healing us thank you for shepherding us through our pain in our hard moments and seasons. Thank you for taking us by the hand and walking us to green pastures, still waters. Oh, our souls are ignited with praise and thanksgiving today. Our souls are ignited with praise and thanksgiving today. There's never been anyone like you, God.
everything changes the darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring and when you walk into the room every heart starts burning there's nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you nothing else matters nothing now sing your love to the Lord we love you We will never stop We can't live without you Jesus We love you We can't And we can't get enough All this is for you starts to vanish every hopeless situation ceases to exist and when you walk into the room come on sing it out the dead begin to rise cause their resurrection life and all you do your prayer. Come and consume God. All we are, we give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come. Come and consume God. We want you. We want you. Singing that prayer to the Lord, our heart and our flesh say, 
seek you the more I find you the more I find you the more I love you I want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your head, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat, cause this love is so deep, it's more than I can stand, I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming.
captivated by love, radiant with love. You've made me radiant. You've made me radiant with love. First love, first love. Hey. You've made me radiant with love. adore him give him thanks and praise for all he's done for you today there's no one like you. there's no one like the lord
love you. God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek you. that it's doing and we'll sing these lyrics to the Lord. Just give me a thumbs up when it's ready and we'll sing. We adore you today, Jesus. We love you. You are the place my 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Jesus. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're with us. We thank you that you've come to live in each and every one of us. We thank you, Jesus. I think we're going to do a little church today. How about that? Does that sound good? I think Jesus is going to set some people free today. How about that? Does that sound good? Yeah. So we're going to do communion, but God's put something on my heart to do this a little different. Um, and yeah, so why don't you come up and grab the elements and then go back to your seats. Jesus. We bless your holy name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that the price, the price that you paid, and we thank you for what you purchased with that price. You didn't just get us into heaven. You got heaven into us, and we thank you for that, and we're going to receive that today. We're going to receive that, and we're going to step out in faith, and we're going to receive everything that you purchased for us by faith. We're going to receive it, Jesus. So I feel like the Lord wants us to step out in faith today. He wants an act of faith, okay? One of the big ones for me was walking up to this altar to receive and to give. It was the great exchange all of me for all of him. And it's where I received my new heart and my new mind and freedom and deliverance. And he restored my soul. And he's just done so many things. So I'm going to list some things that he wants to set people free from and things he wants to give people. And don't come up here because of my voice and what I said. There's no reward in that. But if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and says, go forward, come forward and have communion with him up here at this altar for whatever it is and exchange it. If it's one of these things that he died so that you didn't have to carry, come and give it to him. 
Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. If, if you're believing for something, if it's a restoration or something, come up here and receive it. Receive it by faith. And I believe that he's just going to wreck some hearts today, and he's going to transform some lives, and he's going to break some things off, and he's going to give give some, some of his, his truths, his promises that he has promised to each and every one of us. So... And I just need to kind of wait on the spirit a little bit. I don't want any of this done for my own flesh. I was even debating. I'm like, is this me? Is this you? Is this me? Is this you? Jesus. So, if, yeah, Jesus. You do not give us a spirit of heaviness or fear or depression. So if anyone is carrying fear, depression, or heaviness come forward to the altar and have communion with Jesus. It's one of those things where fear of man will keep you. I don't want to be seen for having any of these things, but by faith is where we receive freedom. When we step out, we step out because we only want to be seen by him. We want to have what he has for us, and we don't care what people think. And that's what kept me for 10 years from coming up to this altar. 10 years never again. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And just as the Spirit leads you, just as the Spirit, have, have a conversation with Him. Give it to Him. Lay it down at His feet. Whatever it looks like, just say, thank you, Jesus, that you do not give me this. Thank you that you died, and I give it to you, and I leave it at your feet, and you take it from me, because your word says to cast it at your feet, and I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Healing. If anyone needs healing emotionally, spiritually, or physically, come to the altar now and receive your healing receive it it's his promise it's his promise receive it if you were like me and had a fragmented soul from what this world dishes out and what this world promises and what this world offers and you want like psalm 23 says and so many other verses you want your soul restored Come and receive it right now in Jesus' name. Come and be healed. Your mind, your will, and your emotions be healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If your heart's been battered and bruised and you want that new heart, if you want to give him that heart of stone and receive that heart of flesh, that vibrant, beautiful new heart that can't be hurt by this world, but that can love this world the way he loves this world, come and receive it. If you want that new mind, that new mind that doesn't have the things from the past, that doesn't have the things that this world raised you up into, but has things, his mind, if you want Christ's mind, come and receive it. If you want freedom from self or from addictions, Come and receive it. He paid for it. He paid for it. Those the sun sets free are free indeed. We thank you, Jesus. If you're believing for restoration, restoration in yourself, restoration in your marriage, and you're believing that, restoration in your family, your prodigal, wherever, come and receive it and believe it and step out in faith. It's a relationship. This isn't a religion. This is a relationship. He loves you. He wants to give you these things. He's already promised you these things. Come and receive it. Deliverance. If you're in bondage to demonic presence, if your mind's in bondage, if your heart, your spirit, you're tormented, he wants to set you free. He died to set you free. Come and be delivered by the Spirit of God. The spirit of religion, if you were raised, raised in a religious environment and it keeps hindering you from worshiping, keeps hindering you from having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, 
We break off that spirit of religion in Jesus' name, but step out and get rid of it. Get rid of it. Pride. If you suffer from pride, come and humble yourself at his feet. His beautiful feet. His blood-stained, pierced feet. He's so humble. He's so beautiful. And he wants to take that away, and he wants to give you his humility. He wants to give you his heart and his love. If you suffer from not enoughness, like you're just not enough, come and know that you are, that he loved you and he paid that price for you because you're his and you're worth the price that he paid. And so give him that, whatever it is, set it at his feet. If it's something that you're carrying, some burden, fear of man, fear of man. If you have the fear of man that's keeping you in your seat still, come and break that off in Jesus' name. Come and, come and hand it over to him and receive a spirit of boldness, a spirit of courage, a spirit of strength. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you are strengthening us, that you are healing us, that you are mending the broken heart, that you are restoring every marriage, every soul, that you give us a spirit of sonship and daughtership, not of fear, where we can cry out, Abba, we love you. We love you. We are one with you. You came so that we could know what love was. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. So we receive that peace. We come and we exchange the burdens of this world, the burden of self, the burden of achieving and performance and everything and we receive your peace right now by your broken body we take your beautiful body that was perfect without blemish that was crushed that became a wound so that we could be healed so that we could have your joy and your joy unspeakable that we could have your peace always in all circumstances so no matter what's going on, we can rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanksgiving in all circumstances. You're so beautiful. You're so wonderful. We love you. We adore you. The price you paid was so great. No greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for a friend, and you call us friends. No longer are we servants. But we are friends. We are brothers. You are the first of many brothers, and we are sons of the Father, and we thank you for the price that you paid, and we receive it. Freedom, total freedom from every addiction in Jesus' name. Total healing from every hurt, every heartache, everything in Jesus' name. Complete deliverance from all demonic oppression in Jesus' name. A new heart, a new heart in Jesus' name. Fear of man has fleed, is gone in Jesus' name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for what you purchased and we receive it. This is not religion, this is relationship. You died so we could have you. You died so we could have you. And we receive you, all of you, all of you, Jesus, all of you, in faith. It's for the believer. And we believe, Jesus, we believe, not a little, a lot. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your blood that was poured out every last drop. And with his wounds, we are healed. 
Yes, Jesus. We receive every drop because you gave every drop. You didn't hold anything back because we were worth every price. We were, we were worth every drop because we are yours. For the prize set before you, your word says that you didn't want one of the fathers to be lost, one of the father's children's children to be lost. And we are those children. We thank you that we're not lost anymore, that we are found, and that we are yours, and that we are healed totally. We thank you for the new mind. We thank you that right now, you're baptizing us with more love, with more fire, with more of your Holy Spirit. Right now, we're receiving more of you. And complete freedom, total healing. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God is enough. And we don't have to strive. We just have to know who we are. And we have to receive it in faith. And we do, we receive it. We receive all of you, Jesus. All of you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, we worship you, Jesus. Just continue to commune with him. This, there's no hurry. This is very personal between you and him. He hung on that cross for a long time. He wasn't in a rush. He wasn't in a hurry. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We restore. You restore everything. You restore everything. You restore everything. Every marriage, every soul, every heart. All addiction go in Jesus' name. All addiction go in Jesus' name. She could come on in We thank you for the newness of life. We thank you for the newness of life. You restore everything. 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 You restore everything. It's who you are. It's who you are. You can't not restore because it's who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love him. Thank you. Jesus, we thank you for the new freedom that we've had, that we've received today. We receive it in faith. Can we give Jesus a round of applause? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for every marriage that's been restored today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Whoo. Ah. All right. We will have the children come up now. We'll pray for them. Parents, if you feel like you want to come and join and lay hands on the children, that's always a blessing. The more, the merrier. And a boy. Ah. <sighs> So I hear this might be our last time with most of you up here worshiping with us. Rumor has it, I believe that next week, you children are going to start having your own worship sessions, at least at a certain age group. I believe it starts. You can stay up here if you want, but it has just been an honor. It's been an honor to worship with you guys. 
It's been an honor to pray for you guys. I don't know how many tears I've wept when I look over and I see you guys worshiping or running around. I don't even care what it is, just to see the beauty that God has put in each and every one of you. And then to see you come up and worship up front, flag, whatever it was. It's just an honor and it's so beautiful and I know it blesses the Father's heart. And uh, whether you're worshiping up here or down there, you will bless his heart. And that's what it's about. That's what our worship is. It's to bless him. It's not for us. It's for him because he's worthy. So, Father, I just thank you for these children. I thank you for each and every one of them. They are beautifully and wonderfully made. And you paid the price to know each and every one of them, to keep each and every one of them, and to draw each and every one of them to you through your love, through your sacrificial love, so that they know who they are. They know their worth and their value and their identity is in you and you alone. And so I thank you for each and every one of them. They are truly a blessing. I pray your spirit comes in to each and every one of them, and it overflows that out of their bellies they have rivers of living water. Thank you, Jesus. And I just pray for their heart and their mind to receive your word today, that your spirit comes and ministers to them, and it never leaves them, and it never forsakes them, and that they know that it will never leave them, and that it will never forsake them, and that you protect their identity, and you protect their innocence in this world that wants to still kill and destroy it. We just say no in Jesus' name. And we thank you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Got to put in my passcode. I can't talk and put in a passcode at the same time. We're so happy that you're here. You know, um, as Chris said, uh, that we're all adopted into this family. And normally I come up here and I say, welcome family, because this is family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm telling you what, there's no place like home. This is home. My husband and I travel quite a bit and we visit other churches when we're out of town. But man, this place, family. And Miss Lily always, she thinks of the word family and yeah, me familia. This is it. So if you, don't, if you don't have a family, if you've been abandoned by your family, we prayed about that, Chris, whatever, you are adopted here. We are your family. Yes. If you need love, you need prayers, you need support, you need anything, we're here. Like I look out across, I know I could go to any one of you out here, even if I just need a hug, a Holy Spirit hug. So welcome. If this is your first time, if you could just raise your hand. We have a little gift for you. Um, inside there, we've got some goodies. You definitely don't want to miss out. We've got some goodies in there for you. Welcome, welcome. Inside there is a little connect card. Uh, if you could fill that out, we would love to get to know you. Um, and. If you have any prayer requests, put those on the back. We want to pray for you and connect, and we'll have someone reach out to you this week. And uh, thanks for coming. We're excited to have you here. Um, uh, sorry. Too many people have told me things before I walked up here, so I apologize. Um, we, uh, Chris alluded to this a little bit um, when he was praying for the kids. Starting next week, we are going to have check-in for the kids starting at 10:15, so they can have their own worship service downstairs. The Lord put it on our hearts um, to have a worship service for them, to teach them how to worship. And not saying anything bad against you parents, but we want to do what you're doing at home. We want to do it here. Because there are some children that do not have homes where they practice worshiping. But we want them to know that it's OK to clap. It's OK to raise your hands. It's OK to get on your knees and to teach them at their level. So we're super excited about that starting next week. Check in 1015 downstairs. You are not required to have your kids down there. You're welcome to keep them up here in the service if that's what you choose to do. But just so you know that we do have uh, that available starting next week. We're real excited about that. So we have a lot of stuff going on throughout the week here at the church. 
Um, I'll run through them real quick. And the slides go um, during our little intermission break and before service too, so you can kind of get those. But all of our announcements are on the Church Center app. If you do not have that, I highly recommend that you download that. It's super simple. Uh, just look for Church Center, and then you'll find our little logo that says Zion Church. All you need is your phone number um, to log in. If you need help with that, you can come see me or William, our Mr. Techie here. That would be great. Uh, but 9.30 every Sunday morning, we have pre-service prayer. Would love for you to come join that amazing, amazing time. Um, Monday mornings with... Mama Lily, we have uh, intercessory prayer here at the church. No matter what your prayer level is, come, join, be filled, pray for the things that God's got going on here. Uh, Wednesday night is our family night. We have uh, youth and children's downstairs and men's and women's prayer up here. So again, just join us. I keep saying join us, join us, join us. Come on, you're part of the family. Get with it. <laughs> so. Uh, yes, so Church Center app for all the other uh, announcements and stuff going on. And uh, in the seat backs in front of you are envelopes. If you would like to give here, you can give online. You can give uh, with the envelope in the black box in the back, or you can text to give. Um, giving is an extension of our worship, and it is an act of obedience. And um, since my husband and I consistently started tithing, and giving of our time because it's not just money. You know, every part of who we are is, is his. And since we've dedicated all of that to him, we have just seen miraculous things in our life. And I've got testimony after testimony, as I'm sure some of you do too. So I just encourage you, you know, continue in your worship with him, with your time, with your talents, with your hands, with your things, with your... You know, I know people here, Bob and Mary give rides to people to come to church and do, you know, that, that's, that's an act of worship. They're doing it for him. Yes. So anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship corporately and for the family that you've provided here in Boise, Idaho, this altar where we can come as a family, lock arms just lay our lives down for you. I thank you for each and every person here. Lord God, for those who are giving their time down with the children. God, we just worship you. We thank you for all you're doing. And I pray for those giving. Lord, bless the seed that they're sowing into this house. It is fertile ground. We honor you with our first fruits. We just love you, Lord. Amen. It's good to be here. So good to be here. Oh, I missed you guys. Thank you. I want to follow up with um, Sarah's announcements for a moment and just let you guys know that we, we have need to serve in every area in this church. Every area, whether it's media, audio, visual, cafe, children, youth, we have need in every area for the body of Christ to step up and help, all right? So I want to encourage you to get involved. If you're not involved yet serving here, you need to be. It's not optional. It's just not. It, you know, in the body of Christ, this is a family, and everyone has to share in contributing to the needs of the saints. If they don't, the church can't function, and this thing will close down and stop. Because if just a few small group of people continue to sustain and uphold everything, it will not last. It's not supposed to function that way. That's not a healthy body. It's not a healthy family. So I am, I am telling you from my heart that we have areas where we need help. And if 100% of the body of Christ contributes, the load will be extremely light. Amen. The growth will be healthy. The church will thrive. Every need will be met. And nobody burns out. Nobody grows weary in doing good because we're surrounded by the next person who's holding us up. And they're being held up by somebody who's holding them up. And everybody's holding this thing up. All right, so we have need in every area, and I'm, I'm, not, 
I'm not going to um, just come down on you and not give thanks for everybody who is helping and the faithfulness that we do have here. I have seen faithfulness in this church that's remarkable. I, I've seen people serve and show faithfulness in this house that is like, Lord, I am so humbled and baffled by that person's heart and their commitment. And, and it's just amazing, all right? But, but as our church develops and as God begins to do more in this house, we need every one of you to really ask the Holy Spirit for his counsel in how he wants you to be involved helping. In one area or two, once a month, once a month. Do you know I've had some of my greatest encounters with God when I'm serving? Some people say, oh, I don't want to miss out on the service. I need to get fed. I need, I need oil. I need all this stuff. God will feed you and give you fresh oil while you're laying down your life. Amen. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Early on in my years, it's like, God, put me in the back. I'll do anything. I just want to be with you. And I, I'd, ha I'd have no name, no title, no leadership. And I'd be ser serving and doing stuff where Jesus was, his glory was just there. His presence was there. And that's all that matters is him. Amen. And you get fed by his presence. So I really want to encourage you to get involved and help us out. Children's ministry, teaching, leading, helping with worship once a month, youth once a month, audiovisual once a month, administrative once a month. I mean, just if you don't quite know what all the needs are, because sometimes in a small church like this, you might think, hey, there, there's not really a lot that needs to be done. There's not. Well, there is. I'm telling you, there is. Amen. There is. Think, think about a household family of two to three or a few kids. There's a whole lot to manage just, just in that. There's discipleship. There's mentoring. There's counseling. There's prayer. There's unlocking doors and closing, closing doors and turning off lights. I mean, there's so, there's so many little details that when, when you realize how much it takes to sustain this thing, to not just get by, but to actually thrive, every detail matters. And guys, we want to be a church that thrives. Amen. We want to be a church that on a weekly basis, we're not shallow in who we can call to volunteer and help out. We're actually deep. There's actually a deep bench, like we say in baseball. They have a deep bench. If that hitter's not hitting, they got a good hitter behind him. And if he's not there, they got a good hitter behind him. They're five pitchers deep. They're five, you know? Amen. The winning team has a deep bench of a lot of committed players. And that's what we need. Because there's times when those of us who are serving can't make it, or we need a break, or we need a vacation, or it's like, hey, we need to give room for someone else to express the ministry of Christ through their lives so that you don't miss out on the whole other half of your Christian experience, which is in giving, which is in serving. So please, please step it up, okay? And you, and you know if it's you I'm talking to. Step it up. I, I pastor this church not because I feel like it and not because I always feel anointed for it. I pastor this church because I said yes and I committed in covenant to God. And it's about what he wants. And that, there's a true place of freedom in that commitment where it's no longer about self anymore. And when it's no longer about self, you start to live really free in the Lord. You start to get healed and delivered and you start to get over yourself and you start to get, you'll find yourself, you're, you're serving God, you'll find yourself getting over depression and anxiety and the fear of man and helplessness and hopeless and all these things. You're just like, what is going on? Well, you're just starting to live for the king. You're starting to serve him. You're starting to be with him. So come on, consider that. Amen. Don't know what you're doing and you want to serve, we'll teach you. There you go. There you go. There you go. Any area, all right? I believe there's a lot of rich hearts in this church. I believe there's a lot of givers in this church. We're not asking for your money. We're just asking for your heart. And we're not asking for anything more than what Jesus has already demanded of you anyways. Amen. So we have the authority and the right to demand something of you in Christ. Amen. There's a blessing there in giving. There's a blessing there in serving. There is. There is. So get involved. We'd love your support. We need your support. We want this church to stay healthy and be healthy. Well, it's good to be here. How about we allow the word of God to minister to us right now? Amen. 
How about we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? You know, his word is a really fabulous mirror. You'll think you know what things look like or you think you know what to perceive until you look into the word of God and you look into the mirror of the word of God and it aligns you real quick, right? right? How many of you have questions you're asking of the Lord and the Lord doesn't necessarily speak right to you. He actually leads you to the word and he lets scripture speak about what he wants to say to you in what he's already said. I believe there's a word today to encourage us. This, this is the time, you, you guys, we are living in a day when um, it's, it's not a time to retreat or pull back. It's not a time to get discouraged. It's not a time to fix our eyes on anything else other than Jesus. Amen. It's, it's a time to really stay rooted and give ourselves wholeheartedly to him and his word and to stay anchored in him. So I believe this word is going to encourage you and impart something today. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence here with us. We ask you to speak to us and strengthen us. Have your way through the written word that you have inspired and carried along all these years for us now in this moment. There's not a section of scripture we cannot learn from and be transformed by. So we come, Holy Spirit. You know every heart in this room. And I pray that you administer to your people today because you love them so very much. In Jesus' name. I want to thank all of you who have upheld this beautiful church while we've been gone for a couple weeks. And just appreciate, Ron, thank you for ministering the word. I haven't listened to the sermon yet because it's not uploaded, but when it is, that's the next sermon I'm listening to, and I look forward to it. Chris, thank you. Chris is down with the kids. Thank you, Chris. I listened to Chris's message the other week, and it was just like, yes, come on, Lord, do it in me more. And... Um, uh, Chris is like a candle that's been melted completely. Yeah. And um, there's no longer any structure to Chris other than the fact that he's melted. And, and what, God, what God uses him to do is to just leak fresh oil in everybody's hearts to fall in love with Jesus. And... Um, And so I look forward to hearing your message this week in my private time and getting encouraged, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for leading worship and just pouring out your heart at this altar like you do and loving on Jesus. It, it was nice to have, have um, to leave and to get out of town and to trust that the worship leader, the Levite steward in the altar, has a heart that's wrecked for God. Amen. It's awesome. Very, very reassuring. Very reassuring. So let's get into the word. Uh, there was, you know, I don't know how many of this happens to you guys, but when I pull away for vacation, I get really into rest and relaxation mode. So much so to when I come back to business like Tuesday to pray and get in the word and hear the Lord, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be too relaxed to remember how to study the word and get in. And it's like, Lord, what do you want to say? I still got my toes in the water and my, you know, I'm sitting in the sand and I'm still on vacation here. And like, but there was just a flood of, of what the Lord wants to say and nourish his people with. It, it, there was just so much. And I have so much I want to share with you. It's not going to be all today, but just a lot of encouraging stuff where the message hasn't changed. The message is still Jesus. The, the king is still Jesus. And we are his bride, we are his body, and he is working and he is doing amazing things. And so we are going to be in Psalm 73 this morning. The message I have for you is called footing. How the Lord delivers you from despair. Footing. It's not a sin to be tempted to despair. 
It's not a sin to be hit with the temptation to despair. It's not. We're going to see here in Psalm 73 that Asaph, the writer of this psalm, was very honest and real with God. And, and God didn't punish him for that. God actually shepherded him through that. And by the end of the psalm, we get to a really beautiful place with God. But I want to read Psalm 73. It's not going to be the whole thing. It's going to be verses 1 through 6, and then verse 9, and then verse 13, and then verses 16 through 28. You guys got it correct up there? Okay, so the mistake I made in emailing you was 9 through 13. I made that mistake. It's actually 9 and 13, all right? So I invite you. It's a... It's a a good section of scripture. You don't have to stand the whole time, but I'm inviting you to stand with me and read. If you physically can, as we exalt the word of God. There was, uh, hopefully soon, there's a message I want to bring before this family just about the phone. Just about your phone. I've been hearing it for a long time. Like, Lord, do you really want me to preach a whole message about the smartphone? And I, I, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have a Sunday. We're going to talk just about that smartphone in our hands and, and how important it is to possess that thing so it doesn't possess you. And uh, not today. Here's Psalm 73, verses 1 through 6, and then 9, and then 13, and 16 through 28. Great psalm. Psalm of Asaph, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Why? Because I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. And, and hear, hear me out. That's a lie. The evil that look like they're not in trouble and they're not suffering, I'm telling you, they go home to a very lonely, demonic, depressing household. Actors, millionaires, billionaires, they're hopeless. They're empty. They're suffering. They're in trouble. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Verse 6, therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Skip to verse 9. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. Verse 13, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. How many of you felt that, like you've been a beast towards God when you've gotten pricked by evil in some area of your life and you've become bitter? Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. I love that word, nevertheless. Nevertheless, how many of you guys have that word in your prayer closet? Lord, I might be feeling this way, but nevertheless, this is the choice I'm making because of who you are. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. God, we need God to hold our hands. We're not beyond that point. We have not matured beyond the point of needing God to hold our hands. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. In Jesus' name, I bless your heart to receive an impartation of his grace and presence today. We have made the Lord our dwelling place because we know that's where it's at. There's no hope outside of him. Footing. How the Lord delivers you from despair. Asaph shows us how a soul can lose its footing. Asaph was a believer. Asaph was a righteous 
Man, Asaph was a worshiper. Asaph was a man who knew about the presence of God and he, and he lost his footing. This happens to the best of us. How do you lose your footing? You ever, you ever walked on a garage floor that had water on it and you didn't know it had water on it? You lose your footing real quick. A rock climber would never tie into an anchor below him as he's climbing, right? But above him. Because whatever is below you that you're anchored into cannot catch you. It happens to all of us. We forget, we get hurt, and we begin to anchor our souls into lower things. And when we fall, we fall low. And that's how we get hurt. Because we forget to anchor into something higher than what we're going through or what we're perceiving or what we're suffering in. Notice verse 18, it is the Lord who sets the enemy in slippery places and makes them fall to ruin. It's the Lord who sets the enemy in slippery places and makes them fall to ruin. Hallelujah, that your enemies are in slippery places and the Lord is going to cause them to fall to ruin. We're going to talk about enemies here in a second. Yet when the righteous slip, when the righteous slip, it's not the Lord who causes it. Rather, it's when the righteous person considers the enemy more than he's considering the Lord. That's what causes the righteous person to slip. When the righteous person starts getting more caught up and overwhelmed by the evil they're surrounded by, rather than the glory of the presence of the Lord. You can feel it at times when your soul begins to slip and, it's, and the Holy Spirit will say to you real quick, you just got overwhelmed by evil. Get overwhelmed by my, my heart again. Get overwhelmed by my presence again. Today we get to interpret an Old Testament reality, which is, here's the thing. The Old Testament realities, even though they came before the New Testament realities, they are no less valid realities than the New Testament realities. They are the first half. They are the former half. They are the first part to the second part. So we get to interpret an Old Testament reality today through the New Testament lens. What, what is that Old Testament reality? That there's enemies to your soul. Amen. Israel had enemies. And in the Old Testament, they were commanded to go and clear out the land and destroy these enemies so they could set up worship to Yahweh. But in the New Testament lens, the lens through which we come back into the Old Testament, we don't have human enemies anymore in the New Testament. We don't. Amen. Our enemies aren't people. Amen. So every time you go back into the Old Testament, like in this psalm, and Asaph is concerned with all these wicked people, and he's referring to people. In the New Testament, we're actually referring to demonic strongholds, to principalities, not people anymore. Ephesians 6.12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That's people. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's, that's the enemy. Amen. So as we revel in the defeat of the wicked, we are celebrating the overthrow of demonic strongholds, not the destruction of people. So, good. so when we're going through something, we don't pray for the destruction of that person that's betraying us. We don't do that in Christ. Christ has saved us from that level of warfare and he's elevated us to a very much higher, greater level of warfare, which is love and intercession and forgiveness and grace and kindness and mercy. The weapons of our warfare aren't carnal anymore. For Asaph, they were. So we get to come to a psalm of Asaph where he's looking at his enemies and he's, you know, he's, God, get them when where's their punishment, all these things. And we get to come with a New Testament lens and say, Lord, my enemies aren't people anymore. That way I can have mercy on people. I can forgive people because they're not the object. They're not the weapon anymore. I, I can go higher and start living in love, start living in mercy, start living in, in grace. And thereby, by doing that on this level with my relationship towards people, I can actually defeat and overthrow principalities and demonic strongholds. But principalities and demonic strongholds retain power and authority if we fight with carnal weapons against the people we think we're against. This whole thing just liberates your soul if you're in warfare. If, if, it's, it's amazing. I'm going to read you a story out of a really good book here pretty soon that illustrates this. 
But I want to give you a few things to consider and meditate on this week. Number one, anchor or tie in to God's goodness. Anchor into God's goodness. Literally tie in to God's goodness. Like the rock climber who's climbing. He has to tie into something higher than himself so that when he falls and if he falls, that anchor will catch him and he won't lose ground. Asaph does this. Asaph declares right at the beginning of the psalm. Did you notice right at the beginning? Does Asaph begin talking about the wickedness he's surrounded by? He knows enough about God and how the spirit works to know how to start the psalm. He starts by the truth is God is good. He starts his psalm. What is that? That's him anchoring into something high before he starts to descend through an emotional process of prayer for a moment. He anchors in to something high. He says, truly, God is good. If you want to go into your prayer closet and complain about the evil around you, start at least by saying something like this. God, you are good. And now let me tell you how I'm feeling. But anchor at the start so that the Holy Spirit has a belief, has a conviction that he can then bring you back to by the end of your prayer. Asaph shows us how to do this. He begins his emotional and spiritual grappling with the declaration of the truest statement in the entire psalm. God is good. Amen. God is good. The last fast I did, God told me, don't do anything during this fast, but thank me and praise me. Don't ask me for anything. Don't complain about anything. Set your face to seek my face and give thanks for who I am and enjoy me. There was something powerful that happened. I don't know. I don't quite know what all it was in the spirit. But every time I found myself during fasting and prayer, wanting to intercede for somebody or or pray over a situation, or thank God, or declare, or do any type of warfare that's valid. In this time of fasting and prayer, God said, do not do anything but thank me for who I am. And for five days, I anchored myself in the goodness of God, and the goodness of God overwhelmed my heart and soul to a place that was inexpressible, to the point where after that five days, it felt like whatever I asked for was easy. Because I was anchored in who God was. And no matter what you're asking for, you know who you're talking to. You know who it is who's loving you and caring for you. Amen. Dis discouragement leaves really quick when you, when you meditate on who God is. Do does the season you're in change who he is? Therefore, that's why you can give thanks in all circumstances. In verses 4 through 15, Asaph starts to descend. What do I mean by descend? He starts to talk to God about what he's seeing outside of the presence of God. In Christian circles, anytime Christians talk too much about what's going on outside of the presence of God, they risk losing God's presence. And they descend into a church that simply talks about current affairs and reacts to current affairs and no longer puts on the armor of God and functions by the Spirit any longer. YouTube's not running the show. The Word of God is still running the show, guys. Amen. This, this thing's still in charge. Amen. The fake news is not running the show. Amen. It's fake. That's right. It's fake. Yeah. It's fake. The Word of God is still running the show. So Asaph, before he starts to descend psychologically, emotionally, and process the wickedness he's seen outside of the presence of God, he's at least wise enough to start his psalm, psalm by God, truly you're good. It's like he's protecting himself in a way. God, truly you're good, but, but I'm saying that so I can complain for a little bit. And by your mercy and grace, I'm praying you'll bring me back to truly God is good. And that's what happens. Who knows? God is good. Word of wisdom, consider who God is prior to analyzing the wicked, if you are going to analyze the wicked. If you are, for a moment, going to try to process what's going on in our world, start with, God, you're good. And I want to be careful with how I tread into my philosophizing about what's happening. Amen. Start with, God is good. Start with, God is good. 
Asaph honors the reality of God's goodness before processing his confusion and pain so that no matter how much descending he does, he is tied in and he can return back to it. The lens through which he interprets wickedness is the secure, sure, unchanging, definite, eternal nature of God's goodness. This psalm reminds us that we are to interpret the times in which we live through the fact that God is still good and he's reigning and ruling and he's got the final word. Number two, be real with God. Be real with God. Don't stop being real with God. Jesus says, don't, don't pray like the Pharisees and hypocrites that just run their mouths to try to sound good. Just talk to God and tell him you need him. Just pray like a child. At the end of all my theological studies into some of the mysterious things of Christ or literature or whatever, I, I always come back every day and just say, God, I really need you. I really love you. Just be real with him. Asaph, this psalm, Psalm 73, lets us know there's nothing wrong with processing what you're feeling or what you're going through with God. For a time, I thought there was something wrong with that. I did. I did. For a time, I, I thought, man, I used to process my pain with God because I was still mature in my development in Christ. And I need to stop complaining. I need to stop doing all this. I just need to get in the presence, give thanks, you know, declare who he is. But there's still a place where you can process what you're going through and what you're feeling with God. I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove it to you. Because where there's vulnerability, there's real prayer. Where there's vulnerability, there's real prayer. If there's not vulnerability, then you're not praying. Verses two through three, Asaph is honest about where he's at. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. You know that scripture, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Amen. But also don't, don't over-evaluate yourself. Don't get too caught up in self-evaluation that you no longer know what God's heart is for you and how much he loves you and the fact that he affirms you. Right. Over-analyzing and evaluating yourself will, will bring in the accompanying spirit of condemnation and shame. Mm. But Asaph was honest with God. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Confessing where you're weak actually becomes the very place the grace of God can strengthen you in that his power is made perfect in your weakness if you allow it. You know, for a time, I stopped reading the Psalms because I couldn't tolerate the despairing negativity and complaining in most of them. I'll admit that to you. I, I like shut out the Psalms. I was like, God, we're beyond that. We're in the New Testament. I can't tolerate David and the sons of, you know, Korah and all these guys. They just complain a whole lot. I'd rather just get to the second half of the Psalm and read where they finally encounter you in your presence and just delete the rest. I thought about it. I, I, thought, I thought about being done with the majority of the songs because of the negativity in them, the complaining. But the grace of God brought me back to a place where I could realize the value of these psalmist vulnerability with God and that the Holy Spirit allowed it. The Holy Spirit trusted, not the person, the Holy Spirit trusted enough in what he's capable of to give his people room to be vulnerable and for their vulnerability to be published even if it was complaining in Scripture because he knew what he could bring them to by the end of that psalm. Amen. This is amazing about God. The Spirit was always patient with them, letting them vent, validating them, hearing them, and then helping them to arrive at or come back to a greater reality once again. He's long-suffering towards us. In his sovereign love, he gives us room to vent and confess for by doing so, he is peeling back layers of flesh, little by little, and layers of deceit in order to allow truth to penetrate our hearts again. So the Lord allows us in his presence to get vulnerable and real and raw because he uses it to peel back layers to get our heart, to get our heart restored again with what's really true. 1 Peter 4.19 4 tells us to entrust 
our souls to our faithful creator. Entrust means to deposit. Think of that word, deposit ourselves into God. Entrust means you deposit yourself into God. The good, the bad, he wants it all. Entrust your feelings to him. Entrust your pain to him. Entrust your weaknesses to him. Be real with God. Number three, allow authenticity with God to yield to spirit-filled discernment. So there's a process here. Get real with God. Be honest with him. And then allow your authenticity with God to eventually yield to spirit-filled discernment. Eventually, allow your authenticity to yield to what he sees and how he sees. Here's what I mean. Pain is pain. We've all got pain, right? But don't let pain become Lord. Don't let pain begin to build new theology. Don't let pain begin to put a lens on your eyes through which you see everything now through your pain. He's still God. But don't ignore your pain. Asaph had pain. His feet had almost slipped. He had become envious of the wicked. He was honest about his pain, but he didn't let his pain become Lord in that his pain was the final interpreter to what he was going through. The feeling of despair could be real. It can be real. It was almost for Asaph. Don't ignore it, but don't build a house for it and don't keep it as a pet. It might not be despair for you. Despair happens when you're going through stuff you don't understand and you, and you lose hope. Despair means to be completely devoid of hope. You might be attacked with that. It, comes, it, comes, it begins to destroy your vision and you can't see the purpose in something anymore. It might not be despair. It might be fear of man. It might be, it might be depression. It might be anxiety. These things you might be dealing with to an extent, but don't keep them and build a house for them and call them by name and, and keep them as your pet. Just because a stray dog wanders onto your property doesn't mean it's yours. That's what a lot of the stuff the enemy tries to bring at you is. It's a stray dog that doesn't belong in your property. And you need to recognize it for what it is and say, hey, that thing's not mine. That's not mine. I'm a child of God. I have no right to be hopeless right now. No way. Hopelessness? You wandered onto the wrong property, man. You're not going to destroy my calling. You're not going to destroy my vision. But you gotta be you gotta be honest about what wanders on your property. You can't be ignorant about it. You're a child of God, and you have to assess the four corners of your lot in life, and you gotta know what wanders onto it if it's from the Lord or not. And then you know how to deal with it. Don't keep what's not yours in the Lord. Psalm one thirty nine verse five says, "You hem me in." behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. God makes you exclusively his possession so that with ever-increasing maturity, you can discern that which is from him and what isn't. In light of the Holy Spirit's presence, you can say, yes, I'm feeling depressed or fill in the blank. I'm being tempted with despair or fill in the blank, but I know the source of this. It's not the Father. It's not mine to keep. It's trespassing. Therefore, in Jesus' name, get away from me. Knowing that he knows your pain and cares for your pain empowers you to heal from it. Number four, don't seek to understand. Seek his presence. This might be my favorite turning point, the hinge of this psalm. Don't seek to understand. Seek his presence. Some of you might be, might be asking me right now, what are you talking about? We're supposed to ask for wisdom. Right? We're, we're supposed to have understanding. Yes, 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 yes. But this is the other facet of the whole thing. Don't seek understanding. Seek presence. Seek presence. Don't just grapple with all your questions. Get into the presence of God. Notice what happens here, verse 16. But when I thought how to understand all this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. How many of you have gotten really exhausted trying to figure things out? But when I thought how to understand all this, what's he trying to understand? He's trying to understand why it seems as though the wicked are getting away with things. God, if you're really powerful and you really are the king of kings and your government 
is overseeing every other government. Why are these things happening? And you start raising all these questions to God. And why am I going through this? And why am I suffering? And, and, and I'm telling you, you'll get exhausted. You'll get burned out. You'll get anxious. You'll get upset. You'll start getting bitter. You'll start closing down relationships. You'll start withdrawing and retreating. You'll start. It's hopeless. But when I sought to understand all these things, it became to me a wearisome task. Do you know, since starting this church, I have had I have had more questions about the body of Christ than I ever have in my life. God, why does this happen regularly? God, why? Why does that keep showing itself? Why? Why? What's up with this? I have all these questions. And you know what God God does? He doesn't always answer those questions. He just keeps saying, come here, be with me. Come get in my presence. That's the only thing that sustained me for six years since starting this church continuing to get into his presence and admitting that I don't know why everything happens the way it does. I don't know. But in his presence, there's fuel. In his presence, there's everything that we need. Because if you find him, you'll find understanding. If you find him, you'll find wisdom. The word here is Know, to understand, means yada, and it means to know the evil, to know the evil. Here's, here's, what, here's what was exhausting. He said, but when I thought how to understand this, when he tried to know the evil he was surrounded by, that became exhausting. He tried to understand and know the evil he was surrounded by, and that's what started making his soul weary. What did he do? He replaced knowing God with knowing evil. Not to do evil. Not to destroy people, not, not to go do evil, okay, but to know why is evil functioning. And there's a risk there. If you try to know evil in, the, in kind of deciphering it and figuring it out, you risk losing your knowing of God and becoming exhausted by what's happening. It seemed to be a troublesome toil. Isn't it exhausting trying to understand life without God? I don't know how people do it without God. Well, actually, I do. They just go deeper into sin and self. That's the only way to survive. The only way to survive without God is to go deeper into sin and self and deeper possession by the enemy because you, you, you can't understand without God. There's something better than understanding in its presence. I can prove this to you. There's something better than understanding. It is his presence. Why does scripture say that you may have his peace that surpasses all understanding? Would you rather understand everything or would you rather have the peace in presence of Jesus that surpasses understanding. Yes. Yes. You, see, you see that little tweak, that little shift? That you don't sacrifice knowing him in order to know the world in which you're living and at the expense of knowing him. So you, you, don't, you don't have to have all the answers all the time, but you do have to have his presence in everything that you're trying to discern. Number five, his presence changes everything. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned. That's why the sanctuary of God is so valuable. And we know that the sanctuary of God is not just this altar, it's not just this building. You are the actual sanctuary of God now. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's just a matter of us acknowledging that Amen. and hiding ourselves in that truth. Notice that in the sanctuary of God, Asaph received discernment or discernment made itself available in the presence of God. So first there was presence and then there was discernment. Amen. And where there's discernment, there's hope. Paul said of his apostleship, we are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Second Corinthians 4 eight. Paul was perplexed about many things in his life and his ministry but how is it that he was preserved in his perplexity from being driven to despair? It was that he continued to cultivate intimacy with Christ. His abiding in God's presence saved him from despair. For Asaph in this psalm, it was entering God's presence that became his turning point. 
You do not need all the answers, but you do need God's presence. You don't need everything to go right and be perfect, but you do need God's presence. Romans 15, 13, I pray this over my own heart and over your hearts today. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Suffering without God is despairing, but suffering with God is restorative. It's coming back to the awe of God that preserves your soul from being overrun by pain. You hear that? Protect the awe of God in your life. Protect the awe of God in your life. It will preserve you from being overrun by pain with what you're going through or dealing with. Stay in awe of God. God, why is this happening? He might speak to you and show you. He might talk to you. He might say, I want you to learn this from this. This is happening because of this. But you, you might not have all the answers, and he just wants you to be like a child and have your awe of him protected. Practice his presence. Don't stop going into his presence. It's the only sure place of pure and perfect perspective. Don't stop allowing his presence to counsel you even when evil has pricked your heart. Sometimes it's okay. It happens to all of us. Evil pricks our hearts. The enemy fires his darts and that's why we're supposed to have our armor on every single day. But how? Number six, but how? How do you enter the presence of God? How do you practice the presence of God? How do you protect the presence of God? You worship. Spend time in worship. Don't let your moments of worship become nothing in your life. Worship. You give thanks. You renew your mind in Scripture. Don't stop pulling on the truth of Scripture. This is an anchor we have for our souls in truth. You make time to talk with God and allow him to love you through his spirit. Another thing we do, we repent. We repent. Asaph's feet started to slip when he became what? Envious of the wicked. Envious. In the New Testament, you become envious of the wicked. I think that's something you should repent of. Repentance is a gift that God uses to reestablish peace in your life when you've lost your footing. You repent. Another way you practice the presence of God is you forgive your betrayers and offenders. I love this one because of how uncomfortable and challenging it is, but, uh, but of how fruitful it is. You forgive your betrayers and offenders and you pray for them. You pray for them. I don't think God wants us to call down bombs on the White House right now. I think God, I think God wants us to pray that the gospel gets into every heart. And that God has mercy on those who don't know him. And on those who are leading out of ignorance. Because the God of this age has blinded their hearts and minds. Forgive your betrayers. Forgive your offenders. Pray for them. I want to show you something powerful and key about this. This, this, it's not that God's absent, but your soul at times becomes gripped by the enemy's assault to where you forget that God is present and you're wondering, where did my peace go? And this is how you wage the good warfare. Obedience to his voice through humility. Did you hear that? You wage the good warfare by obedience to his voice through humility. Let me read you something. Let me read you something out of this book, Turning Sorrow into Joy. Some of the story of Kent Kent Christmas, pastor of Nashville Regeneration, prophetic voice. I don't always read many books outside of Scripture because how many of you know we need more time reading the Bible? Right. It's, it's hard finding time to read the Bible. Um, 
We were at Barnes and Noble the other day, and I was there to pick out. We were there to pick out some books for our kids so that over summer they can stay reading, and pick out a couple books that they can read and enjoy. And this book stood out to me. I was like, "Holy Spirit, do I need to read that book? I'm really feeling like that. That book is just like, I need to take that thing home and, and read that book." And um, this book is one of the best books I've ever held in my hands, guys. Absolutely amazing absolutely amazing some of these successful ministers you really don't know what they've been through it, sometimes we judge and we criticize really successful ministers that are out there right now and and we do not know them we just don't we just don't know them and so this this book i i've i've been reading and here's something that i read the other day about this principle forgiving your betrayers and uh, a very anointed man, God has used this man powerfully, him and his wife, and uh, it's good to read what they've been through. It's good to read their story. It's good to read and learn about how good God is. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, I, I pray that as I read this, Holy Spirit, you wouldn't use this to cause pain in anybody. If, if it does, I, I pray that you would heal it. Holy Spirit, use what I'm about to read to heal, to help. Kent Christmas writes, divorce was one of the hardest things I had ever experienced, even worse than dad's death. Divorce feels worse than death because death usually is not a personal rejection and it provides some sense of finality or completion. Divorce does not. This man for years tried to win his wife back as she was committing adultery on him for years. And it came down to divorce with his first wife. It wasn't something that he wanted and he fought for and continued to forgive and continued to try to restore but unfortunately, he went through a divorce, and this is what he has to say, and you'd have to read the whole story to get the whole picture instead of just judging this man. Moreover, it was difficult emotionally for me when someone you really love breaks your heart. You don't suddenly stop loving that person. I certainly didn't. Memories of my marriage and thoughts of Patty being with another man haunted me. One night I was tormented with grief and my sleep was repeatedly interrupted by nightmares. I tried to pray and God spoke to me lovingly but firmly. I want you to pray for them. Pray for who? Pray for Patty and the man she's with right now. I ain't doing that, was my knee-jerk response. My righteous indignation rose within and I said, I hope they get to hell. I hope they go to hell for what they did to me. No, God said, you pray for them. Have you ever wanted to argue with God, but you know it is a pointless waste of time to debate with him when he has already told you what he wants you to do? That's where I was. I finally acquiesced. Okay, I said, but I don't mean it. God spoke back one word, pray. See, because he was struggling with nightmares and grief after his divorce. He wasn't able to get free from nightmares, and he's asking God to bring peace and restore, restore his sleep and take away these nightmares, and all God's telling him to do is pray for his betrayers. I did. Lord, I pray for Patty and her man. I said, I ask you to forgive them for what they've done. Please don't let them go to hell. It wasn't a fancy prayer, and it certainly wasn't heartfelt. See, here, here's vulnerability, guys. Here's vulnerability with God. Sometimes when God tells you to do something, you be vulnerable with him and say, I ain't doing that. I can't do that. I don't feel a thing. I don't feel an anointing to do that. Not everything God wants you to do comes with an anointing. Amen. If it did come with an anointing, then you'd have zero responsibility for obedience because all of your obedience would come down to the anointing. Amen. There was no anointing to pray for Pastor Christmas right here. It wasn't a fancy prayer, and it was certainly wasn't heartfelt, but I kept at it day after day, praying for two people whose actions had seared my soul. I prayed basically the same sort of prayers every day, and then after about two weeks, an astounding thing happened. I'd say two weeks was relatively short. 
about an, an astounding thing happened. I found out that I meant it. I truly prayed for my offenders and asked God to be merciful and gracious and forgiving toward them, just as he had been toward me. And I meant it sincerely. I don't know for sure what effect my prayers had on Patty and her man. I can tell you what happened as a result in my life. Remember that spiritual oppression I I encountered in my dreams? It was gone. The day I truly meant my prayers for Patty and her lover, the torment in my heart and mind disappeared. This, these are the weapons of our warfare. Amen. We got to sharpen these weapons. We got to get acclimated to these weapons, you guys, because if we're being tormented in any way, there is a stronghold the enemy has on our heart because we are in disobedience in an area of weaponry that the Lord is calling us to. The torment in my heart disappeared. As I released them to God, the devil had no, he had to unhand me and let me go. It was as though my unforgiveness were keeping me a prisoner. But the moment I released it and began praying sincerely from the heart for my offenders, the torment was gone. I was free. Amen. This is crazy. No, actually, it's the gospel. Amen. Because you don't forgive people only when they come to repent and acknowledge their sin. You don't. Amen. You don't. That is not a biblical principle that you can only offer forgiveness when the person comes to make things right. Jesus hung there on the cross and forgave them ahead of time, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, Father, ahead of time. And we are called to be just like Jesus. I won't say it was easy. It wasn't. Usually when someone hurts us or offends us, we feel justified in condemning them to hell or worse if we can. That person hurt me, Lord. I want to call down fire on them and see you zap them. But we are not justified in doing so. Not if we want God to forgive us. That's serious. Jesus said, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. The moment I truly forgave Patty and her friend, I was free, free to live, free to enjoy the blessings of God in my life, free to look up and see the new day and new relationships that God was bringing into existence for me. After I began to pray sincerely for Patty and her friend, God broke the soul ties, and I had no more bad dreams. Moreover, God loosened me from the past so I could look into the future. Amen. Sometimes what we go through has such a stronghold on us, and we don't realize how much of our soul ties to a relationship or the past is still hurting us until we forgive. It doesn't have to be a spouse. It doesn't have to be in a marriage. This, this can be someone who's hurt you. This can be a circumstance, a situation. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Number seven. And I'll close with this last one, and then I want to exhort you through prayer. When you're pricked by evil, it is an opportunity to overcome. Mm. So good. I've been counseled recently by somebody in that when offense comes, it's a blessing. The blessing of offense. There's another phrase that sticks out to me that's even greater than offense. The blessing of betrayal. When your heart is pricked by evil, it's an opportunity to go deeper in your Lord's grace than you might have ever known or experienced before. I was in Los Angeles with my family this other week on Friday the 31st. I had not been too plugged into YouTube or media during this trip, so we were in the LAX airport terminal and I went into a market to get some snacks and as I was checking out at the market, there was a freshly printed copy of the LA Times on the counter with you know who on the cover, guilty on all counts. Instantly, a heaviness came upon me for our country. I grieved. I felt the weight of despair for a moment. See, I, I, I didn't ignore the despair I felt in that article. I felt it. I felt it. I was pricked by it. And I sensed that it was an opportunity to see something and to overcome. I sensed the Lord whisper as I saw that article. I am good. I am trustworthy. 
Do not fix your eyes on the wickedness that you perceive in the land at the expense of losing your intimacy with me. According to scripture, it's not possible for darkness to prevail against the light. The news, the L.A. Times, they're not publishing things according to what scripture is doing. They're not showing the light. They are falsifying and presenting the darkness and the corruption. And I pray, I pray over the body of Christ in this time that we're not deceived by it. So that the church becomes hopeless and falls apart in the midst of the darkness that we think is prevailing, but it's not. It's not. Guys, it's not. It's not prevailing. Scripture actually declares that when darkness increases, so too does his light. Isaiah 60, verse 2, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. We live in amazing times. We were at Huntington Beach on Memorial Day. My goodness, what a packed house on that beach of all places we could be on Memorial Day for vacation. There was not a square inch of that sand that didn't have a piece of skin on it. Like, well, Lord, we chose Huntington Beach for our beach vacation, and uh, this place is a packed house. And thank God, rest is a state of mind. But here's what can happen when you're. I don't know if anybody else feels this, but when I travel, I sense the spirit of the area. And sometimes it's extremely obvious. You don't even have to be discerning. Well, in California, you don't even have to be discerning to sense the spirit. And I hope this message has very low views and people don't use this message to move from California to here because I want to stay small here. You don't even have to have discernment for the spirit in California because you smell it. The legalization of marijuana. You're on vacation and the kids are like, what is that? (laughs) Oh, that's pot. That's marijuana. It's legal here, kids. They smoke it. They drop it. You know, whatever they want to do. You see it. You see it. There's, you know, I, I, I knew California didn't have a dress code, but that dress code has gotten even worse. (laughs) People wear or don't wear whatever they want. Transgender, male, female, whatever. There, there's no boundaries anymore. There's no lines. Everything's been crossed. And in that environment, you know, there. Hear me out on this illustration as I close. I'm not here to glorify the enemy. I'm going to glorify the Lord by the end of this. I'm kind of doing what Asaph did when he assesses the evil for a little bit and then gets back to, okay, this is where it's at. But in California, you're walking on on the beach and you smell marijuana. Everyone's got their boom boxes, man, riding their bikes and scootering and boom boxes off the back of their bikes that are the size of this uh, speaker right here. I mean, (laughs) music wars. It was it was absolutely crazy in in one square foot area. You're hearing mariachi music just blasting and carne asada being grilled on the sand, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'll, this feels like home to Laura. And I could be, yeah, this is awesome. You walk around the back of that speaker, and then you hear all this rap, and uh, you know, and and then all this other stuff. And I'm not even gonna, you know, name, but there's these there's these music wars going on, and the smell of marijuana, and people are barely wearing anything, and you, it's like you. you the spirit in this place, man. Yeah. And you, you, if you're not careful, you can lose your footing and get really discouraged. And that's when despair, that's when the temptation to despair comes because you see all that. And for a moment, you wonder what God is doing. Like, where's the hope? Where's the light? It's darkness seems to be raining on the beach. And, and here, here's the thing. Here's what happened with Asaph, okay? 
It's all a matter of perspective. It's all a matter of where you're standing. Your footing will slip if your perspective is surrounded by what's happening in the darkest places. But Asaph did what? He had to make an attempt to get into the presence of God, and then I discerned. Because here, here's what's happening. Half mile, a half mile closer to the pier. I didn't see this on YouTube until I got back on my phone, and this video was on the front page of my YouTube, and I had no clue because of my perspective. I was at a beach a half mile from the pier, surrounded by all that that I just told you, you know, renouncing it. That's not getting on me. All this stuff. The Lord's like, just chill out and enjoy your family. <laughs> just go get a wetsuit and a boogie board and get on the waves and let my waves crash over you and have fun. And just because you're surrounded by it doesn't mean you're in it. And you really don't need to repent of anything just because now you smell like pot and you weren't smoking it. So we're enjoying our time at the beach and there's a, there's a manifestation of the times of the age, the spirit of the age. Little did we know, a half mile down closer to the pier, I saw it on YouTube, this video, Huntington Beach over Memorial Day. 12,000 people got baptized and committed their life to Jesus. Had no idea. What's up with that? See, we risk being so caught up in what is what's in front of us. We have no clue what God's doing a half mile down the road. You guys know that YouTube video I'm talking about? Did anybody else see that? Of all places, Huntington Beach, there was 12,000 high school students, youth and college age students that gave their life to Christ and they were being baptized and revival was breaking out. The light was shining. This is what's amazing about God. God doesn't just say, oh, California, Huntington Beach, that's a dark place. Let's have revival away from that. He says, let's go to that spot with all the nudity and all the smell of marijuana and all the rage music and rap music going, and let's actually release the kingdom of God right there. Right there. So Asaph came into the presence of God, and then he discerned. It's like, for me, YouTube was the presence of God for me coming off vacation because I was like, whoa, a half mile from where we were, revival was breaking out, and I had no idea. Does that not illustrate oftentimes how easy it is for your feet to slip when all you're looking at is one little thing of evil and you do not see the whole picture of what God is doing? So don't, don't, don't get hopeless on me. Yeah. It's not a time to get hopeless. Amen. It's a time to stay sharp as a believer. It's a time to, it's a time to stay rooted in this and not be overwhelmed by what you're seeing in one moment, on one day, in one week, in one month. Let me close by exhorting you. I believe it's time for hope to sweep the bride off her feet. Darkness might seem great at times, but it's not as heavy or as great as the glorious presence of God that's available to us in these times in which we're living. I exhort you today to strengthen yourself in the Lord's presence. O oh, saints of valor and courage, it's not the time to hide from the Midianites in the wine press when you've been chosen to shine and overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Gideon was hiding from the darkness. Gideon was hiding from the enemy. Gideon was hiding from the warfare. And God sought him out and said, Gideon, get out of there. I have a task for you to go overthrow and defeat the enemy. Amen. Asaph declares at the end of this Psalm, verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 28, but for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your Works. I believe there's a restoration of perspective today and an impartation of fresh courage to not be defeated by despair in regards to anything you're seeing or going through, but to rise up and be courageous and strengthened by the Lord in this time. I believe the Lord wants to bring the greatest thriving and success and prosperity to the body of Christ in the earth that's ever begun and been established. Amen. 
I believe God wants to save, heal, and deliver whole multitudes of people if we just continue to give ourselves to him and say, yes, use me. Amen. Yes, use me. There is a world out there dead, waiting to be introduced to Jesus. For a time, I would pray over the youth that passed by this church during the school year. And sometimes I'd pray, Lord, raise up somebody in our church to go after him. Let's, you know, why isn't our youth group prospering? Why isn't our youth group growing? All these things. And over time, the Lord just began to tell me, the youth group is passing by your church. Every day, that's your youth group. It's them, it's those kids. On their phones, vaping, swearing, cursing, that's the youth group. And I want you to go after them. I want you to go after the youth. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't have time for that. I, I have time to just pray and intercede and hopefully you raise somebody else up to go after the youth. <laughs> I'm the covering, you know, I'm gonna <laughs> equip the saints to do the works of ministry and I'm gonna hide in my office and pray and study. And God's like, no, I want you to go love on them. Went to the store, got a big box of all these chips and protein bars and Gatorades and we got that basketball hoop out there. We put some balls out there. We put those benches out there. And the Lord just had me at the end of the close of the school year, just go out there at about 2.30, 3 o'clock when the kids would start passing by and just sit out on my tailgate and just yell at the kids and say, hey, free snacks over here. Come get one. Gatorades, chips, protein bar, you know, like God loves you. Not, not preach at them, but just say, hey, if you want a free snack, come get one. And, and I would just sit there. And some of the kids, you know, would, would come right over and be like, what, what's all this about? Like, I was like, hey, my name's Zach. I serve at this church right here. I just want to share, I, I want to share God's love with you and, and bless you and know that you're seen. And, and just started to love on these kids and help yourself to anything, you know. And they just started having snacks. And then they stuck around and they shot hoops. And they started sitting on the benches and just didn't want to leave. Didn't want to leave. It was a group of kids the first day I was out there and they were walking by that way and I said, hey, free snacks over here. Just want to bless you guys. Come on over. And, and some, some kid in the group yelled at a bunch of his other friends, about nine of them, and said, don't go over there. That guy's going to rape you. <laughs> I mean, out of the mouth of babes. I mean, they'll be honest. And I just yelled back, I'm not going to rape you. I'm going to bless you with a free Gatorade. See, these kids don't trust anybody anymore. They, they don't have anybody to trust. And so those kids didn't come. But the next day I was out there, that group of kids that thought I was some weird dude, they came over. They got some snacks. They got to know me. We spoke some things into their life. They started shooting hoops. And I started building a relationship with these kids and just loving on them and just realizing how much, how much they're looking for the gospel. They're waiting for the light to change their lives. They have nothing else to do with themselves. They would stick around even when I had to leave and lock up. I just said, hey, you guys can stick around and stay. And those balls, just hide them behind the bush when you're done and come back and shoot hoops whenever you want. I'll see you guys next week. But like there, there, is, there is influence and revival just waiting to happen through your life if you just give yourself to what the Lord wants to do and get over yourself. Amen. And it's so liberating. It's so liberating. You, and, instead of critiquing the evil, instead of assessing the evil, instead of weighing the evil... Instead of praying bombs drop onto the White House, Amen. you just get out there and you start loving the hell out of people. And if the body of Christ does this thing, the light will overcome the darkness. Amen. It will. It will. Come on, stand and pray. I want to pray over you. I want to pray three things over you today. I want to pray three things over you today. How many of you feel just a little more strengthened today in the Lord? I want to pray three things over you today. Go ahead and just receive. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray a resilience over your people. I pray a strong backbone, an anointing of the Holy Spirit to stand firm to be resilient in the Lord. I pray over this church. I bless this church with a resilience to not give up, 
to not grow weary, and to not back down. I just pray an anointing to be resilient in the Lord, not over, overcome by what you're going through, not overcome or overwhelmed by the evil you might be seeing or perceiving, but a resilience to be strengthened in the presence of God. Number two, I pray an anointing to function from his presence despite what you see in the natural. I pray an anointing to function from his presence despite what you see in the natural because this is what Christ did for every one of us. Before we looked holy, he pursued us because he saw what we could become with his help. So this is our opportunity to to see situations for what Christ can achieve through them instead of being overcome by the hopelessness in the situation or how dark it is. So I pray, Holy Spirit, I release an anointing to function from your presence despite what we see in the natural to walk by faith. And thirdly, lastly, I pray a fresh outpouring of hope and empowerment of grace over your people. If anybody is in here just feeling like you've lost some vision or you've got some despair or you just feel like the zeal of the Lord has leaked out of your bones or where's the momentum or how do I overcome this? How do I get through this? I just pray right now a renewal of grace i pray right now an empowerment of hope that the lord would show you what he sees that you would let go of your questions and trying to get all the answers right now and you'd come back to the presence of god and just say jesus i love you i just want you i don't care what it looks like whether the situation changes in a day or three years i just want your presence i just want your presence so i pray i pray body of christ that we would value his presence and receive the hope and the anchor of hope that he gives. I bless your spirit today. I bless your soul today. I bless your mind and your heart to be renewed by the hope and the strength of Jesus Christ today, that in your next moment of discouragement, you'd actually find yourself being overwhelmed by the presence of God, and discouragement would be crushed. Hopelessness would be crushed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you in the name of the Lord today. Come on. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Don't even try to be strong in your own strength. It's not the time for that. You just don't do it. You know what? If you've been being strong in your own strength, I encourage you. uh, Our prayer counselors are going to come up right now. If you just want to relinquish your own strength on the altar this morning and sacrifice your strength, come and do it. Come and yield your efforts. Come and sacrifice what you've been trying to accomplish in and of your own might. Come into the presence of God and let him minister to you and care for you and empower you and strengthen you. Saints, bless each and every one of you. Bless your homes. Bless your jobs, bless your finances, bless your calling. Bless you to thrive under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who want to continue to come to the altar for a little longer and be ministered to, please come. Please come. We're here to pray for you and build you up in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.